Canada's Woke Nightmare, A Warning to the West, is a hard-hitting documentary about Canada and the state of affairs in our culture today. And with me here today is the journalist and producer of this incredible documentary, uh, Stephen Edgington. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much, David. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. Well, Stephen, first of all, congratulations uh, for this uh, great documentary. Uh, I know that you're the Daily Common editor and a journalist with the Daily Telegraph certainly one of the UK's leading uh, newspapers. Why did you decide to undertake this documentary? I think British viewers are obviously fascinated in our former colonies, in the Commonwealth, in countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Canada has been somewhere where I think our readers in the Daily Telegraph have been very interested in, in terms of its political developments. And whether that's through the trucker protests a few years ago that was very widely covered here in the UK and more recent developments that we cover in the film. I think that, as I say, as the title of the film says, Canada, a warning to the West, that's why people are so interested in your country. It's because I think when you see the excessive way that the Canadian government has taken so-called woke ideology or excessive liberalism and implemented it, I think the outcomes are absolutely fascinating and represent for us a warning. I have to say, I don't say that, um, you know, with any glee, uh, you know, you're, you're obviously in Canada and have to deal with these situations. We also have our own problems in the UK, of course, and we can talk about that, I'm sure, later on. But I think that, you know, there's always this, there's always been a historic link between Canada and Britain, and we're very concerned for what's going on in your country at the moment. So looking at your knowledge of the UK and Canada now, would you say Canada is truly a warning to the West? Like, it's an interesting dare I say, provocative title. So are you saying Canada is like really far out uh, as an outlier in front of, when, when compared to so many other countries? I think it is. I think that everything that we covered in that documentary is more extreme in Canada than in most Western countries. But actually in the West, and this is, an, this is the conversation I had with Jordan Peterson where he made this point, Canada really is an outlier when it comes to these issues. And if you look at the way the Canadian Parliament has acted in terms of enabling the legislation to, um, I suppose, to restrict freedom of speech, to, I think, what ha what's happened in Canada, it seems to me, as is that this legislation, this kind of woke legislation has become embedded in law. Whereas if you look to somewhere like the UK, we're having huge cultural issues here at the moment. Um, in America, you've got different states with different laws on these subjects. But in the UK, we've had a conservative government for the last 13 years. There are huge issues here. We have we face exact same issues as you do in Canada in terms of wokeism, etc. But the legal framework is less, I think, than in Canada. I think that we have some laws which I think are causing huge issues. The Equality Act is one of them. In US states, obviously, um, there are some states that are worse than others, and you have federal legislation as well on top of that. But in Canada, the Canadian Parliament seems to have gone further than most Western countries when it comes to these woke ideas and kind of woke ideology. So why, why has Canada gone down this path further than others? What's your theory on that? Canadian Canada's identity as a country, I think, has historically been a bit weaker than, let's say, Western European nations. So you could look to England and English history, and we have a thousand years of consistent history as a nation. And over those, over that millennium, you can see uh, traditions form. You can see. Uh, our legal system is created, the English common law is created over hundreds of years of precedence being set. You can see a real tradition that can be traced back, as I say, a thousand years. And when you're able to have a system like that, that can 
iron out all of the problems over over lots of people making different errors and different mistakes, you get to a point where you have a very, very stable and strong identity as a nation. And um, you can rely on those institutions. Whereas in places like Canada, those nations have existed for a, a lot, uh, you know, fewer years than um, than their Western European counterparts, and it takes it's, it's a lot harder to build that sort of national identity, particularly when the the idea of the British Empire, the idea of Canada's past, where it came from, has become so unpopular in Canada. So the idea of colonialism, of the white man coming over and taking other people's land and oppressing the native populations, this has become a real kind of a, a narrative of guilt. And I think many in Canada have tried to disassociate themselves from their own nation. They're embarrassed about their past. So they have to create a new narrative. They have to create a new identity. And what is this new identity formed on? This new identity is formed on wokeism as an ideology. Canada is going to be, we are going to be the most liberal, the most tolerant, the most progressive nation on earth. I think it's this sweeping away of Canada's historic links to Britain, of Canada's traditional identity, and replacing it with something very novel and something very new, and that is the, the concepts of multiculturalism, tolerance, progressivism, and ultimately wokeism. I, I think that's a brilliant uh, summation, and I almost don't know whether to cry or smile when I hear that type of summation, Stephen, because when I saw the documentary, and I've, I've shared it with many, many uh, colleagues and friends, um, people are kind of embarrassed by it. Um, at least this is the common reaction I, I received. For this reason, is that Canada has inherited an incredible tradition from the Anglo-Saxon tradition of rights and freedoms and respects for, for people's rights. Um, and we don't seem to get it. It's like we've, we've forgotten it or we're, we don't even understand our own history. It's really kind of bizarre, isn't it? So it's interesting to hear your perspective as someone from the UK, a, a person from another nation, come in and say, wow, this is, this is what's happening to your country. So wake up. Uh, I, to me, that documentary was very powerful in that way. I am so concerned for what's going on in Canada. And I think people around the world and in Britain are so worried for ordinary Canadians. And particularly, and can I say this about the, the Canadian media, which is something that I am I find absolutely extraordinary. When I was in Canada, I was told by so many people that, that Canada's media are not covering the topics that we covered. No, and I have no. to say, I was absolutely shocked and astounded at how well this documentary did. I never expected four and a half million people on YouTube to watch this film. Wow. I mean, I literally completely blew my mind. I mean, it's the most watched thing I've ever done in my career. You were surprised, Stephen, uh, that it went so viral? Absolutely. I couldn't believe it. And I have to say, I, I, have, I, I suspect the reason it did so well, or one of the reasons it did so well, particularly among Canadians, because most people who have viewed that film are Canadians, right? If you look at the statistics, I suspect it's because... Canada's media are not focusing on the issues that we covered in that film because they feel that those issues are too controversial to touch. Now, I know there are some exceptions to that. And we spoke with some of those fantastic independent journalists at True North, even mm -hmm. a rebel media and in other publications and more independent voices that we spoke to. Billboard Chris is another one. But beyond that, the, the kind of mainstream media in Canada seems to be ignoring, to a large extent, many of the topics that we covered. I'll give you an example. We went and interviewed a woman in Montreal. Just She lives just outside of Montreal, Christine Gautier. Mm -hmm. She was one of the most amazing people I've ever met. I mean, just an extraordinary figure, real hero. She was a veteran. She was a Paralympian. And for many, many years, she suffered with terrible disabilities, physical disabilities. And she's had to um, try and deal with that through the Canadian government asking for assistance. And, you know, she was saying, I want dignity and respect in my life. And the response from Veterans Affairs Canada, the agency that was dealing with her, the chap on the phone said to her, well, um, you know, the ramp is a bit expensive and it's difficult to get it for you. She's been asking for the ramp for many, many years. Um, have you considered assisted suicide? Wow. And I mean, to say that to some, again, I, in, this, the, can, I, I suspect this can only happen in Canada. This can, and um, we can talk about the made laws in more detail. So 
she, Christine Gautier, just to finish that story about the Canadian media, she said to me that she'd been interviewed by the Italian media, by the French media, literally people coming all the way from Paris to her home. We obviously came all the way from London. What have the Canadian media done to report on her story? Well, originally, they came to her house and they wanted to talk to her about Veterans Day. And suddenly, I think this is two Canadian media outlets, and suddenly they, they discovered this story. And, and to be fair, some of them did cover the story. But she was saying... Basically, this her amazing and extraordinary tale has been covered far more by the international press. And I include this is including interviews actually with Fox News that never got released in the end. So the Americans, the French, the Italians and, and the British all covered her story. But the Canadian media, to a far lesser extent, did so. And I think that that says everything you need to know about what's going on in the sort of Canadian media landscape. It was very emotional to see that story. And I think that's part of the power of that documentary is you tell a lot of heartfelt stories about Canadians, about their struggling and they're, they're essentially victims of this asinine, woke, hate-filled kind of ideology and approach to living. It's, it's really quite an eye-opener. So um, there's a very powerful clip there uh, that we can show about uh, her story. So you've done a lot for your country. How do you feel Canada has treated you in return? <sighs> Completely abandonment. Can you tell us what happened when you asked for this? Was it the, yes. the, the ramp outside you needed? Yes. I said, you know, I, I just can't keep going like this. I can't keep living like this. Like, with this has to be done, this has to be resolved. And the person stated, you know, Madame Gauthier, if you really feel you can't go on like this, if you really feel you can't do it anymore, you know, you have the right to die. So it's like, wow, I can't believe, you know, after all of this time, not only will you not give me the equipment I need to live, but you will help me die. I don't think it's a government's place or an hospital's place to decide, yeah, okay, you're a little depressed this week. Here, sign this, people, this paper three times, I will ask you, you sure you want to die? I, I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong, and I think it's just going to keep uh, drawing this country into a deeper, deeper, deeper hole. Another story that you got into, Stephen, that I thought was also very revealing was by this wonderful family. I think it was the mother and the son who were of uh, obviously proud Canadians, but of Indian background. And they reflect on their historical experience of Canada um, and how it evolved and, and, and multiculturalism. And, and it was just really kind of a, a delightful interview. It was also got these crass elements to it, but it was, it was very, very interesting. So did that surprise you, how that, that fellow described gender ideology as being militant within schools. I mean, I, I thought it was really quite quite a shocker. This is so, such an interesting topic, isn't it? And, and sort of how multiculturalism has been a bedrock of sort of Canadian identity for decades now. Mm -hmm. And you could go back to the 70s and look at what Pierre Trudeau was doing with his sort of multiculturalism act, etc. And you've seen mass immigration into Canada for many, many years. And I think when you look back to some of those immigrant communities, many of them integrated very well into Britain and into Ca and mm -hmm. into Canadian society. And this was a fantastic example of a family who come from India and who had respected Canadian traditions, who wanted to become Canadians, who, res who sort of respected the rule of law, who wanted to learn English and, um, and be part of that really strong Canadian identity and, be and to be Canadians themselves. And I think they really admired, from what the discussions I had with that family, they said they really admired Canada as a country as a peaceful, safe, wealthy, excellent place to live. And it's no surprise that these immigrants do not agree, or many of them do not agree, with Justin Trudeau's yeah. and the Liberals' vision of Canada today. They come from a religious background, whether that's Christian or Hindu or Sikh, which was the example that we were into. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were from a Sikh background. And they are traditional. They are, in their own way, conservative. According to the this family that came from India in the 1970s, the people that I was speaking to, the mother, she was saying she was so distressed about how Canada has become since this huge influx in immigration in the last 
few decades that she actually now wants to leave Canada. She doesn't feel safe anymore. She thinks it's too expensive. She's absolutely she wants to leave. That's that's and I believe that's into her intention. She's so the quality of life for her, she feels now has become so bad and she lives in Toronto um, that she wants to leave. So, you know, and and she she herself was blaming that on this huge rise wow. in, in immigration that has caused so many issues in Canada where you don't have proper integration into, into Canadian society. You don't have people respecting Canadian traditions and you're having a two tiered system. You're having segregated society. So I think that can only lead to ultimately division and a lower quality of life for everyone. It's, it's really bizarre. It's a very powerful story uh, that you tell in the documentary. Another story that you uh, aren't afraid to discuss, and that is about the whole restorytelling, if I can tell, if I can say that, of residential schools. The bottom line is it was not perfect. There was abuse that happened, but there was also a lot of very positive things that happened in those schools. Um, and that's not me making it up. That's from reading the original Truth and Reconciliation report of some 3,500 pages. Uh, a lot of people have never even read the report, so they don't even know what's in it. Um, so what I, what I find fascinating is that you, you had the, the insight to pick up on that as a very significant story, the one that can be used to kind of, uh, dare I say, rewrite Canada as a kind of an evil nation um, and, and to rewrite history. Is that why you picked up on the significance of that story, Stephen? This has been a subject and a narrative that has been pushed in Canada by many conservative politicians, by many liberal politicians. And I suspect the motivation behind that is because there is a narrative of guilt. And mm. and in Canada, I think, you know, the liberals, they want to have their own narrative and they decided, look, this is the perfect opportunity to mm-hmm. um to express our our guilt for for basically being white for being rich for being a wealthy western country and there's got to be some terrible reason behind this and perhaps it's because we oppress the indigenous people now i think the second reason we thought this was so, also so interesting was how how truth itself in canada has become attacked so the idea that suddenly that there, that there is a genocide against the indigenous people became um, the official narrative. I mean, the Canadian the Canadian Parliament passed the resolution to describe it as such. Justin Trudeau urged the Pope to uh, have this kind of decree to say that there was a genocide, which he acquiesced to, unfortunately. And even, as I say, the Canadian opposition, the Conservatives, agreed that this was a genocide and apologised um, for this terrible uh, supposed uh, happening however the only problem is there's no evidence for it so suddenly you've got all of these politicians creating this narrative which is utterly false and now as we explored in the film canada's justice minister is considering passing laws which would actually uh, ban people from denying this narrative they they're comparing it to holocaust denial but unfortunately in canada and to a certain extent in britain and other countries um Politicians are undermining this high trust society, this, um, the, as you say, the rule of law, um, the belief in truth, the belief in fact, and are undermining that by pushing false narratives. And I think it's a complete disaster for our structures as societies, for Western civilization, when you have political leaders pushing lies and trying to punish people who disagree with them, um, you know using evidence and facts and logic um, with with the law. And that is authoritarianism. And that's what happens in authoritarian countries. That is what happens in um, in, in communist societies, in communist dictatorships. So I'm, I think it's very, very concerning. And that's why we wanted to look into this Kamloops uh, issue. We need to run on facts and evidence, as, as you've said so well, uh, Stephen. So I did want to talk about some elephants in the room about the documentary. One would be and I think you're the person to help us, you know, explore this question. And that is about culture. What is it about? Is there something about Canadian culture that is so susceptible to these um, woke ideas? I mean, the wokists are masters at using words and things like diversity, equity, inclusion, and yet they're being used and they're almost kind of attractive. What the heck is going on that our culture seems to be so susceptible to this, Stephen. 
I really, really feel awkward talking about this. And I tell you why, because it's not for me as a Brit to judge other people's cultures. I feel very embarrassed <laughs> um, to, to make some comments, right. which some people in Canada might find uncomfortable. So please forgive me. Yes. Um, and I'm going to uh, sort of, uh, sort of say this first, first of all, I had a fantastic experience in Canada. I think it's an amazing country. I met some really, really inspirational people. I was genuinely, and this is, a, 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 you know, I'm not just saying this because of the film or whatever. I, I really felt this. Not only is Canada, Canada a warning to the West, it's also uh, an example of inspiration and ho of hope. And there are so many Canadians who are fighting back against what's of what's going on. And we met some so so many interesting and inspirational people, including Christine, including many others who we interviewed in the film, who I just thought, wow, you are amazing and you're so courageous. And I think there's so much we can learn from you. And there's so many Canadians who are like that. So that's my kind of qualifying statement. OK, so is Canada a polite country? Is Canada a nice country as the stereotype goes? In my experience, and in this experience of me and my camera, and as we went to Canada, we unfortunately met some Canadians who were not very polite and who were not very nice. Um, but, but that's wow. not everyone. And I think that generally, ca Canadians like to um, see themselves as a polite people, and they like to see themselves as a very welcoming people and a very tolerant people. And the problem is, and this is the thing that we discussed in the documentary of Jordan Peterson when we talked about the psychology of wokeism, the psychology of Canada. I asked them to put put Canada on the psychologist's table and to psychiatrist's table and to figure out what is going on in Canada that makes them so susceptible to wokeism. And he basically said, when you have excessive niceness, that to a, to a, to an extent that is also a weakness and that en enables predatory psychopaths this is what jordan peterson said essentially left wing authoritarians to take advantage of people's tolerance and people's niceness and people's politeness and to push their boundaries to such an extent that they can win this has led unfortunately to people like justin trudeau to push a very, very radical agenda onto Canadians and to stop people from speaking their mind. And I think that's another theme that we had in the documentary where we spoke to Canadians and many people said to us, we totally agree with you. You know, we're not woke. We don't like what's going on. I find it totally unacceptable, but I can't say it on camera. I can't, I just can't say it publicly because I'm so concerned about the backlash that I might have in my personal life, from my friends, my family, but also from my employer. And that's the scary thing, from my employer and from the government. When that, when that um, I suppose, idea permeates throughout government and throughout, in, and throughout in private institutions in terms of your employment rights, that's the difference. And I think in Canada, that's the worrying thing where you can say something and you could be fired for having holding very, very normal political beliefs. So the other side to the elephant in the room, I would say, is who's really working to advance this type of woke culture. Um, we, we have the usual suspects, but I mean, the role of, of political leadership in this is really quite significant, isn't it? I think it's partly the politicians. Justin Trudeau has to take a lot of responsibility for this. Conservative Party hasn't done enough uh, to push back. The media hasn't scrutinized the government. And um, unfortunately, this is a decentralized movement. Many, many uh, activists throughout many institutions um, are pushing this individually as well. So you've you've got a lot of perspective on these issues, Stephen, not only in Canada now, but also in the UK and elsewhere. What would you say are some of the lessons that you've learned coming out of this documentary? Uh, is is one, one lesson I think that you you referenced is that you get what you tolerate, ironically. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And I think um, this idea of uh, tolerance, I think Canadians should learn a bit of intolerance for once. I think I think you've got to stand up for yourselves. I think, um, you know, I interviewed some amazing people who are doing that and who are fighting the good fight and who are trying to raise awareness and who are trying to organise. And I think um, when you see in the UK, we've had some very successful movements pushing back against, let's say, gender ideology. We have some uh, feminists in Britain who are, who are doing wonderful 
um, things here in, in shutting down. There was, there was something called the Tavistock Clinic, which was a clinic which was transitioning children. Yes, that then got indeed. shut down after pressure from activists. We've seen some excellent wins in the UK, even in the US. In some states, you've got people like Ron DeSantis passing legislation. So I think there are some amazing things that ordinary people can do, um, you know, going all the way from just you know, as I say, parents or whoever, to the politicians at the top. I think people need to grow a backbone. I think that it is possible. Don't give up. It's very possible to fight back against these things. I know that um, there's an election, you know, in, there will be an election in Canada where you will have a choice on the ballot for Justin Trudeau. And I do hope that Canadians um, decide, you know, and I think when looking at opinion polls, it looks that Justin Trudeau is, you know, every day becoming more and more unpopular. But I think that there is a fantastic opportunity um, for much of what's happened in Canada in recent years to be reversed if people decided to be a bit more intolerant of the woke ideology, a bit more intolerant of Justin Trudeau and had a bit more courage. And I think that, as I said, we have highlighted some of those Canadians who do have those amazing qualities. And I think that we can all learn from from these amazing individuals. Stephen, I really like your challenge to all citizens to not be afraid and to speak up. Uh, this is a very important time for our country in Canada. And I want to thank you on behalf of all Canadians, quite frankly, for taking the time as a journalist from the Daily Telegraph from London to be able to come to Canada and uh, help tell our story so that we can be better informed and aware of it. Thank you so much for your uh, great insight and leadership. Thank you, David. I really enjoyed being in Canada. I loved interviewing you. I think it's an amazing country. Don't get me wrong. I feel very, I, I don't like criticizing other people's countries. Um, I think there's lots of wrong things going on, on in Canada. But as I said, I think there are some so many inspirational tales as well. And I think I, I cannot say, you know, I, I cannot say how much I was impressed by so many Canadians. So thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, journalist with the Daily Telegraph, thank you so much for joining us for all your insight and your leadership. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.